once again to another edition of the Science and Insight podcast. Joining me, Judy Curtis, we have our resident psychologist, artist, instructor, uh, Lawin Connie Nagel. And of course, on the other side of the microphone, we also have the very lovely David P. Curtis, artist and instructor and all round good guy. So hopefully uh, you're still enjoying uh, our uh, gathering round the festive mic to talk about all things art. Uh, now, you might remember, if you heard our uh, episode last week, we were talking about Gestalt. And it was interesting because during the week I've been going around, I've been working on a couple of projects which include a lot of fine art by past uh, American Impressionists. And uh, I find myself looking at paintings and trying to analyse them a little bit better than I used to do and looking for that all-important Gestalt in in art. Uh, of course, Gestalt refers to a lot of different things. It's the the wholeness, the unity of uh, of shapes, forms, and also there's that Gestalt theory and the psychology of that, which I'll leave Connie to talk about at another time. But um, when you look at some of these paintings, what really makes a good painting, and you can see when you look at them. Uh, the, the wholeness of them, you see the whole painting, there might be variety but it's all unified and therefore it makes makes a whole. Uh, and I hope you've been taking time to have a look at some of your favourite paintings and just see if you can find the gestalt in the pieces that, that you admire. So, but that's just a little aside. Uh, today, uh, we're moving on to uh, a, quite a different uh, theme. So, without further ado... Okay, so this week's topic is going to be uh, about the question, can you paint an effect of light? So, I had to um, look up uh, a couple of quotations for this because I feel sure somebody's put it into a better effect than I could do. Uh, John Constable felt that the sky is the source of light in nature and governs everything. Whereas Paul Cézanne says, Light is a thing that cannot be reproduced, but must be represented by something else, by colour. So, Connie, what do you mm. think? Can, As an artist, can you capture uh, an effect of light? Can you paint the effect that you see in nature? Um, I think we try. To do that as mm -hmm. artists, and especially as plein air artists, landscape painters, outdoors, we're we're trying to capture that effect of light uh, as the sun moves from mm -hmm. you know east to west, uh, uh, the the whole gamut. Um, I think that uh, we we do capture it sometimes with this chiaroscuro, you know, creating an effect of light without color through mm -hmm. values. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a way of creating light through bold, pure color. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that David and I have been talking about for Sight and Insight is that, that we think that, that you can create an effect of light uh, in your painting through color and design. Mm -hmm. We think also that the design element uh, plays strongly as, as a, an element of light. Like you can, you can have a, a barn positioned in a certain way so that you have the light hitting it. You, you get that strong note of light against dark. Okay, yeah, so that... It would help, I suppose, if you're a, a plein air painter and you go out and you want to continue with your example, if you want to paint a barn, does it help if you know what the sun's going to do and therefore what that effect of light would be? Do you have to plan ahead? Or can you just set up on the day and, you know, what, what's your thought process when you get there? Is it... You know, well, I do think that you can, you can paint on site and that you do tend to, over time, plan ahead. Yeah. Because you know where the shadows will be okay. hitting the, the landscape and, and how those shadows might, might appear. Uh, but, David, you might well, have a thought on that. I think a good painter uh, knows what it's going to look like in the end. Whether it comes out to look like what he <laughs> imagined is, an, is always the question. 
uh, and there might be touch-ups later in the studio. But I think every painter is very confident once he chooses, which as a teacher, I, I find sometimes they get locked into. I think Hibbard used to say, don't stand on a, on a thin, thin dime, because <laughs> it might not support you. You know, um, So you, you, know, you really need a good composition. I think Connie's on the right track, that even composition can help to create the effect of light. Or in this case, we, we really stress the idea of movement. And is movement, does movement in some way represent light? It represents, I think, movement represents space. And I think it also represents, could represent perspective and depth. Uh, on a two-dimensional surface, to create the illusion, uh, the optical illusion of an effect of light, um, is a lot of it was interpreted, I think, early on by artists as form. If they could achieve form, that would be light. Because at night, we don't see forms. It's all flat. You know, the house is just a flat silhouette uh, because there's no light on it. As soon as the light hits it, we see form. So I think a lot of painters interpreted the effect of light as the interpretation of form. Um, and I think it then along came the Impressionists and said, no, we're not even interested in form. We're interested in the effect of light, which we feel, as Cezanne said, color, mm -hmm. color first. And I think probably because of all the color theories that came out of the uh, 20th, um, 20th, 19th, mm -hmm. end of the 19th into the 20th century, all those color theories came around all at the same time that the idea of optics and how we perceive things changed slightly. Um, and then we, we were having a little discussion about the difference between um, abstract art, modern art, mm -hmm. or contemporary, whatever, how, however we label it, and traditional art. Um, and maybe that was because of the cultural problems that was happening in the world. Our earth was, uh, you know, revolting or had a lot of revolting elements in it <laughs> in the 20th century mm -hmm. um, and causing a lot of death and destruction. And maybe that was a reason for the abstractionism. I, I have no idea. I can't understand those. Those are bigger concepts. Connie could explain those things much better than I could. <laughs> I'm not sure but about that. But as far as the painting goes, I think, um, yeah, we boil things down to color and design, much like an abstractionist would. But I think the difference is, is this old tradition of form and coming about. But I, and I think that this is relatively new, how much f uh, color creates f the illusion of form. Hypothetically, you know, um, a lot of my students will come, we're painting, doing a sunset class, and uh, they're saying, well, shouldn't I have warm things in the foreground and cool things in the distance? Well, I said, you know, all you have to do is look at nature, it's warm in the distance and cool in the foreground. So the observation of nature is very important to create these, these effects of light because um, I think it all bases out of nature. But I think you're right, Connie, values, chiaroscuro, just light and dark, Rembrandt's self-portrait of him, the old man sitting in the shadows with a, just an effect of light on his face. Certainly everybody looks at it and says, wow, look at that effect of light, you know, uh, even though it's very umber, uh, earthy colors and things like that. There's no bright lights or colors. So with all these, um, with all this information we have uh, from the 20th century, now that we're in the 21st century, I think there's going to be new ways of understanding how to capture the effect of light. And I think it's not only uh, Connie sort of ventured down the road of that design um, is an important part of making light, but only through the understanding of what form does. Exactly. By, but, That's but, right. You know, but by putting a, because... uh, a dark figure in the foreground, just silhouetted, and then figures in sunlight behind them, all of a sudden creates depth of field. Mm -hmm. And it's, but the question I have for our psychologist is is it is it just because we have a storehouse of imagery um, that is is has light and shade in it that that's what triggers the idea that this two dimensional thing looks three D or has an effect of light? Well, uh, speaking with the psychology background, is that we do we do formulate um, a lot of preconceived ideas 
about what what the world looks like. And we use that as we grow up. We're using those all the time, more and more. And in fact, the faster you are able to interpret evolutionarily, we know that, that the better off you are. So the faster you can interpret there's a car coming at me, then you are, <laughs> so are you able... to get out of the way. <laughs> yeah, you can get out of the way and, and so forth and so on. But but in uh, so so we do tend to use that, but maybe we use it, overuse it, and we need to kind of undo ourselves from those preconceived ideas about what is in front of me, the barn, as we said, the tree, the the person silhouetted in front, and the light hitting behind. We want to kind of uh, take ourselves out of that and just see. Uh, one of David's best thing is fractals. You know, he talks about patterns, <laughs> patterns, and that design of patterns. Uh, the light note hits a pattern, and that creates a form. So, um, but the other thing I was going to say uh, is that uh, how does light affect feelings in a painting? And, and where do we get the effect of light creating um, a certain uh, emotion? Mm-hmm. And I think that you see that in, in masterful painters' uh, paintings. You get, you get something that comes out of that. Um, uh, and, and even in, uh, let's say we go out and do plein air painting uh, today, there'll be a, a feeling that is inter- injected into, let's say, my painting, David's painting. And uh, it may not be if somebody came up to, to watch us painting, they may say, well, I don't get that, that feeling sense when I look at that scene. <laughs> So what is that? That is an that's an aspect of of light and how I'm interpreting that light with yeah. color. And everybody else will, you know, everybody will see it differently. Differently. Yeah. differently. yeah. Well, that's interesting. And it, just you saying that brought to mind uh, an exhibition that I saw a few years back um, in uh, in Harrogate, uh, in Yorkshire, uh, an exhibition of works by Atkinson Grimshaw, who was mm. uh, local painter in that area and he's famous for doing these um sort of moonlights and gaslit streets and uh, it's to me they're very evocative of a different age and of course I like them because of paintings around uh, Leeds, yeah, Whitby Docks, uh, Harrogate, yes. all, all these kind of, I mean it's mm-hmm. an urban genre you might say, mm-hmm. but they're all... Um, so in the sense that it, even moonlight creating effective light, it's still, the, it's still the question, is it, as Connie says, the psychological feeling uh, in the moonlight that I think Connie's yeah. correct. Uh, that the moonlights of Atkinson Grimshaw certainly do create an effective light because it's moonlight and, yeah. and it's yeah. reflected light from the sun. Yeah. But yeah. Um, a beautiful work. But yes, that's an effective <laughs> light too. Yeah. So we can sort of see that early idea of just black and white can, can help mm-hmm. to create the illusion mm-hmm. of, um, of the effective light. Um, I, I think... Connie recently did, uh, a, we talked about this before, I know, but you did a Monet copy. Right. Now, there was nobody else attributed to capturing light like Claude Monet. You would, do right. you agree? I agree. Totally. Because why? What would be the explanation as to why you think he was able to well, get it? Well, my sense when I was copying this piece, uh, which was called the Grand Canal in Venice, um, is that right off the bat, he had a a light color key. So so his um, palette had had hardly any uh, dark values in it. Earth colors. Mm-hmm. Uh, had zero earth colors. Mm-hmm. Zero, I would say, in, in the Grand Canal. They were all pure notes. They were uh, colors that reached a high, very high pitch. Uh, they the key was was set in soprano, <laughs> and uh, and was it warm or cool? Would you say? I would say 
Wow, I would say it was both warm and cool. Ah, very interesting. So he balanced. <laughs> um, I think he did. Ah. I, um, because um, I didn't. I felt that there were warm notes in certain areas, cool notes that that uh, depicted some of the water. Uh, uh, but but actually, I think a nice balanced, uh, harmonious painting um, arises. Whether it has the effect of light in it or not, right? You know, it could have just very small effects of light in it, uh, like the Grimstead. I mm-hmm. think those have a lot of dark notes, and yet mm-hmm. those punches of light are really um, maybe reach their peak right. because yeah. they're they're used, they're utilized completely. Yeah. Well, know? I do think your your Monet came out really good. And when I saw it, I've never really, to be honest with you, I never really cared for the composition in that painting yeah. because there's a dark blue pole, and I can't figure that out in the foreground. Right. Um, I agree with but you. But when I looked at it, and I noticed other people who looked at it, when they first looked at it, they didn't like it because of the composition. But their second look, they saw the light. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? And then the effect of light really in your in the copy really said, wow. And it was made up of all these prismatic little little yeah. uh, broken color pieces or pointillist uh, color yeah. notes that added all up to to what the theory was or what Monet had as a theory of of being able to capture light is uh, yeah. is a little shape of orange, a little shape of green, a little shape of blue, and all juxtaposed in the right way. Those color notes in the right value. Uh, to create the illusion of sunlight on an object. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I thought that that's what came through in that piece. That's real interesting. Um, I wouldn't have picked that piece either. Um, it came back to me from the MFA said that they couldn't give me the piece that I wanted because it was in the corner of the room and that people couldn't get around me, couldn't get around the artist. And when you are painting in a museum... People have to circulate, and uh, they stand behind you and talk, and uh, they so no, they, they never heckle. heckled. Oh, but that's nice. <laughs> but they did want to catch my eyes, uh, you know, and catch my attention. And and one time I stepped back, and this man. Uh, caught my eye, and he said, I want to take a photo of you. <laughs> and, and so it was like he'd almost had it on his little tip of his tongue. You know? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> but no, I, I think you can capture an effective light, but the like I said, is it because every human has a storehouse of, um, of, um, of knowledge that they have seen the sunlight hitting mm-hmm. buildings, boats, sky, clouds, trees... And for it's a storehouse of memories. I think there is collective. some of that. I I think that, um, and also I think that there's, uh, as I said before, does an effective light create a feeling? Well, I think it does. I mm. think that when we see this bright hit of light that that hits, let's say, the side of the barn and creates this bright, dynamic, almost blinding mm. light, that it's also kind of warming to the soul because it's like a bright sunny day yeah. it's a something's it's good uplifting. you know yeah yeah, yeah. yeah and it's not this storm and depressing you know. person yeah. sitting in the shadows yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right so i'm depressing no 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 i keep on thinking you know you say that no i i think uh, uh you know i'm the thorn between two roses <laughs> No, well, you're not between us. You're on that side. Well, I'm going on the side of two roses. Uh, no, I, I think it's, an, it's a great question. Can you paint an effective light? Um, the, oh. other, the other way of looking at this is, uh, you know, sometimes people lose the effective light in their paintings because they're, they're manipulating it a little bit because they want it to look a certain way. And uh, I think what Monet was saying is if all you do is go out and hit the right color and match Mm. the color, it wouldn't make any difference whether it was a grain sack or, you know, the light on the side Mm -hmm. of a tree or a figure standing in a meadow of flowers. It wouldn't make any difference what the object Mm -hmm. is. So sometimes we get caught up in the literalness. And if we let go a little Mm -hmm. bit and just really try to do the optics or the purity Mm -hmm. of what we see... Uh, and be, uh, I don't want to say honest or truthful, but just hit the note 
the way it is that nature is presenting it, uh, rather than, like I said, manipulating it a little bit, um, I think uh, I, I think we could start heading in a in a different direction to, yeah. with painting. But isn't isn't that what impressionism was supposed to be? It wasn't the object; uh, it was the light hitting that yes. object. So right. that it's right. not important that it's a boat or a barn or a, mm -hmm. a haystack. It's how it looks in the way the light hits it. So right. you've got the shadow side, you've got the light side. Um, I think also when we when we talk about teaching painting, um, that hitting light notes throughout your composition is a good way to get yourself out of that literalness yes. that David was just referring to. That sometimes we get so caught up with we have to have that tree look. It, it has this kind of interesting design to it, and I want to capture that. Yeah. And instead, you want to to kind of bust your way out of that, and you can do that with hitting light notes throughout your piece. Mm -hmm. Like, look at the whole scene, kind of uh, open your mind up to, to seeing, I got a light note in the sky, I've got one that's hitting this rock over here, and then I have it hitting the side of this tree. And, and in that way, we keep moving ourselves forward to complete the piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, can you believe it? We've uh, finished another uh, episode here. That was uh, fascinating. You, you start off with a, a simple question like, can you paint an effect of light? And I thought, well, yes, isn't that the whole idea of the going outdoors and painting? Uh, but when you listen to two artists talking about it and about uh, what it means to try and get that effect, it uh, opens up a whole new world for you. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, Connie, David. I know you're anxious to get out and paint. I can see you're psyched for this, you're inspired, so without further ado, we'll uh, let you go. Thank you for joining us, hope you'll be with us next week when I think we'll be talking about muddling through or some such thing. So hope you'll join us then. In the meantime, thank you and have a great week. <laughs>